of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. It's all in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. If you please be seated. You know, I've kind of been all over the place thinking about uh, what to share with you uh, this morning all over the place this last week. Uh, but let me start by asking, you know, those of you who are here, maybe watched on video or whatever, I, I started last week with a question for you. What, what do you expect out of life? And I gave you a couple seconds to think about that and get your mind going in a particular direction. Um, but I want to follow that up with, with maybe a, another type of question is what do you think God expects or wants for you out of life? What do you think God expects or wants for you out of life? Again, I hope I'm not going to give you a lot of time, but I'm sure you've got an idea of which way your, your mind goes, has gone. And I, I want to just uh, ask you to consider what you just thought about at the beginning of last week's message and, and just now a few moments ago. Is, was your focus more on the here and now or was your focus more on eternity? That will reveal to you a lot about what you're concerned about in life. And only you can answer that for yourself. Nobody can answer it for you. I'll tell you what God wants for you. It comes up in scriptures all the time. And it comes up in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians right here, the verse 23, where he writes, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. That's what God's after. To sanctify you and me completely, fully. And it goes on, and may the, your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that shows that Paul's focus is on not the here and now as much as it is the eternity. Although the eternity will be a result of God's activity in the here and now. And so in a way, maybe those questions were slightly trick questions. Maybe just a little bit. Heaven is God's goal for you. To sanctify you completely and be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we're in, as we know, we're in the season of Advent. And Advent is a season of preparation. Um, I, we don't have the bulletins uh, that show the different candles being lighted each week. Faith, hope, love, peace, all those. But I'm sure you, that you saw that uh, Jacob, I asked Jacob to light the candles for us. But he was the most recent individual of this parish that got some, has, was baptized. But we lit three candles this Sunday, not just to symbolize the third Sunday of Advent, but the, uh, the pink candle, the, the joy, the joy candle. Joy because we're getting close to Christmas. We're getting close to celebrating the first advent of Jesus. But joy also because we are also getting closer to experiencing the second advent of Jesus. Are, are we looking forward to that? I hope we're looking forward to that. I hope that's in our mind. Uh, maybe not necessarily all the time, but maybe a lot of the time, irrespective of whether we're in the season of Advent or not, but just all year long. This chapter that Paul, this letter that Paul writes to the Thessalonians, this fifth chapter begins with that idea of the second Advent of Christ in mind. First, verse 1 and 2, well, I'll maybe read a little bit further than that uh, from chapter 5. It starts off this way. If you still got your Bibles open, you can follow along with me. I don't know the page. I didn't look it up. But regardless, I'm going to read it to you. Now, concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. We've heard that recently on recent Sundays as well. Why do we keep coming back to these? Because God wants us to get the picture. We'll come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, ah, there's peace and security, and then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you 
are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or dark of, of, of the darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Paul is addressing these people. He's addressing us. God is addressing us through the Apostle Paul in this letter. Are we awake? Are we awake? You know, again, if you had all come to Christian Ed, just as I said last week, I wouldn't need to give you a sermon today <laughs> because, again, he hits on much of the same stuff that is coming up in our scriptures. He uses many other scriptures to make his point. But did you also, did you hear our collect prayer? I hope that's not just a, a dead moment or a, a silent space in the service for you. But when we have this, this is a collect prayer that has been prayed in the church, well, I don't know for how long, many, many, many years, longer than any of us have been alive. Listen to it once again. Stir up your power, O Lord, and with great might come among us. And because we are sorely hindered by our sins, let your bountiful grace and mercy speedily help and deliver us. Stir up your power, and by your mercy and grace deliver us. That was one of the primary message of our uh, adult ed class today is the connection between God's grace and God's power. Power to live the life that He calls us to live. And He made a very, very clear and I think a very, very important distinction in all of that. Uh, Carol ended the, the session by telling us we could see that session again on online for free, if, if I remember correctly. You just go online, go to YouTube, look up John Bevere, G Good or God, Session 5, and you can see the whole thing. I encourage you to do that. Now, here's a question for you. You heard me say it. Have you just rushed that out of your mind, or are you thinking, okay, I'm going to do that? It's about 45 minutes. Carve out some time. If you, if you weren't here this morning, carve out some time to hear it. But it says, stir up your power, O Lord, and with great might come among us, because we're sorely hindered by our sins, let your bountiful grace and mercy speedily help and deliver us. Do we want, ask yourself this question, do I want this power? Do I want this power that comes with His mercy and His grace? Or do I just want the mercy? Do I just want the grace? But do I want the power as well? And maybe a follow-up question might be, well, well, how, how does it show up in my life? How do I get it? How do I recognize it when it's here? And, and the call that goes on says, deliver us. May let your bountiful grace and mercy speedily help and deliver us. What is it that we're asking to be delivered from? Well, sin, sin, of course, eternal damnation, of course, but deliver us from the constant influence that we place on ourselves to live life for ourselves, and rather than living life for God. Living life for ourselves as opposed to living life for God. Is that a focus of ours? Pay attention when we get to the end of the service, the concluding prayer after the post-communion prayer. Just, just pay attention to that. You know, to, to be delivered will take our heartfelt and our honest participation for this, this sanctification that Paul mentions in his letter. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. It's going to take the constant focus of ourselves for that and to pass on to those around us as we make disciples of one another to teach them how to do it, what that means and how to go about it. It takes our heartfelt participation. 
You know, one of the things that Jesus said at the end of his life, just before his crucifixion, you can find it in John chapter 17, verse 4. He says, I've completed the work that you gave me to do. You ever stop to think about that? I've completed the work that you gave me to do. Are we thinking about why we're here and what is the work that God has given us to do? What is that work? What is that ministry? Is it something that just makes us feel better, This floats our boat, so to speak, or is it more than that? We could come back to another question, is he? We say he's Lord of our lives, but is he? Is he really? Do we live it out? We are called to live it out. And no, that doesn't mean we're going to be doing it perfectly. But if it's not part of our focus of life, we may not be doing it as he wants us to do it. Deacon Hank and I and a number of other clergy uh, from the Anglican Union went to a, a clergy day this past Thursday over at Church of the Resurrection. Uh, Dr. A Alan Dayhoff was, was our speaker, and he was a pastor for many years, built a multi, multi-million dollar church. Uh, and then the day it came to him, he says, you know, all all's we're doing is we're, as it's been said, he didn't say it this way, but we're shuffling chairs on the Titanic. You know what that means, you know. We're just bringing, trying to bring people into our church, but they're coming from other churches. That's all we're doing. He says, we're not out there, using the phrase that he used, we're not out there in the wild trying to reach people for Christ. What's the Great Commission? Go. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe, teaching them to uh, follow, to obey everything I have commanded you. Again, is that our focus? And what, what Alan Dayhoff did was one day he just turned in his resignation as senior pastor of this huge church and just started to get, find a way to get out into what he called, again, the wild I want to challenge us the, here this morning. How is it that we might perceive ourselves getting out into the wild? I'll tell you the way he did it. Doesn't mean you have to do it this way, but maybe we need to take a, a lesson from him. He started to visit a blues bar down the road from him. You know, not pretty close. He says, he says, blues bar. Why are there blues bars? He says, he says, because people show up in a blues bar that are str struggling in life. Life has turned into nothing but just the blues. He didn't do anything. He just started to go. He just started to go. This was about five years ago he did this. And struck up a conversation with the bartender. She asked him, well, who are you? What do you do? And when he told her, she says, you can get out right now. He didn't, he didn't leave. <laughs> Long story short, he says, this is my parish now. People know I'm a pastor. We've had funerals there. They come and they sit and they talk. And even this bartender that told him to get out, when he gets introduced now to new people come into the bar, oh, this is, this is Pastor Al, he comes with the bar. <laughs> Getting into the wild. He says 85% of people and he, will never really come into church that aren't already in church. 85%. So how do we reach them? We have to go where they are. We have to go where they are and find some way to make a connection. Now, I'm going to tell you something. In my, my own experience in trying to do that, as I've done it, and I haven't done it well at all, but it's been very difficult, very difficult. And it's scary, but just think about that. What might be the proverbial blues bar for you? Where is it that maybe God is sharing you to go, just go get involved with them? I've known people in the past that have uh, joined bridge clubs just because they wanted to reach the people in the bridge club with the gospel. 
And yeah, yeah, they did like to play bridge. I joined the Christian Motorcycle Association many, many years ago with the idea that maybe this would be a, a, a way to get into the, the non-churched motorcycle community. And I wish I could say there's been a lot more success with that, but, uh, but still it, it is something, but it's a little thing. It's a little thing. How do we reach them? Again, the Great Commission says go. I want you to think about that, not only for the rest of Advent, but for the rest of your life, <laughs> until Jesus comes back or until we go to see him. How do I go? Teach me how to go. I've listened to some videos uh, lately, you know, uh, videos get sent to me from lots of different people. And uh, one that I uh, watched recently from actually sent to me from a member of the parish. Um, and this was, you know, you've, we've hit on that passage from Second Chronicles numerous times. Second Chronicles 714, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves, seek my face, pray, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from God and I'll cleanse their land. That's not an exact quote, but it's close. And this particular person who's had his ear to the proverbial ground about how the church is living for, for many, many years, he says his perception was the church prays it, but the church doesn't do it. That's because have we do we have that power that the collect talked about? Do we have that power? Do we want that power? Do we understand the grace, the power that comes with that grace uh, to humble ourselves, to seek his face, to pray? I mean, really pray. I know that this congregation needs all those things, and I'll tell you why I know it, is because we offer a lot of things to you all, to everybody, even on online, to be become a better disciple and so many of the things that we offer even some on Sunday morning are not partaken of by members of this congregation they're just not that tells me some things I don't know if you all get emails from me but sometimes I'll ask a question in that email please tell me this I get precious few responses from this congregation that either tells me you're not reading your emails, which is a primary way for us to communicate these days, or you think I'm just trying to fill up an email with a request, or you just don't care. And that scares me as your pastor. That scares me. Now, some of you do respond regularly when I ask a question. I thank you for that. I thank you for that. And I know some of you have other people that will respond for you because you don't do email yourself, but maybe your husband or your wife does. That's okay too. But that scares me. It scares me. Are we ready? Are we ready? If Jesus were to come back any minute, like the sign used to say, are we ready? Or are we just cruising and saying, eh, I'm covered by grace, it's okay, it doesn't matter. No, it does matter. You're not saved by how well you do, but you are called, we are all called to pay very close attention to these things. Another thing that shows up in my mailbox, uh, email mailbox, is these John Stott quotes. Let me, well, let me pause for a second before I share that with you. How many of you are, are on Facebook? Hold your hands up if you're on Facebook, okay? I see a few. Keep, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. I see a few of you. Okay. How many of you know that this church, this congregation has, keep your hands up. I didn't ask you to put them down yet. <laughs> How many of you know that this church has a Facebook page? Okay. All the hands are up. How many of you see those posts? Okay. See a lot of hands still up. How many of you share those posts? At least pretty frequently. A lot of hands going down. Why? Why? I got a flip phone. You got a flip phone, okay. <laughs> you need to come into the 21st century. <laughs> That's okay. But those of us who are, do you know what a mission, do you, do you all know that you are missionaries? 
Yes, no, yes, yes. yes. You are missionaries. You are. Whether you know it or not, you, you, before I just said that, if you didn't know it, you know it now. You are missionaries. We are all missionaries. 2 Corinthians uh, for chapter 5, I think maybe it's chapter 6, Paul says we are Christ's ambassadors. It's another way to say we're missionaries. You know what a missionary does when they go to a new culture? What's the first thing they do besides trying to figure out a way to, to you know, provide food and shelter? What's the first thing they do? Go to the blues bars. In a way, in a way, that's true. In a way, that's true. They learn the language, and they got to go to be. They, they learn the language. What's the language of the culture in which we live, especially when you think about the teenagers, twenty-somethings, thirty-somethings, forty-somethings? What's the language? Social media. TikTok. Well, whatever. That's one of them. That's one of them. Uh, but social media. If you don't want to reach them, then again, are we, well, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we're not seeking to reach the people and we can do that kind of a thing through the social media or email or other, from the comfort of our own living room, office, bedroom, whatever you want, what does that say about our hearts? desire for the lost, for the 85% of the people that are not in church and are not going to come to church. If we're waiting for them to come in the door, that's a losing battle. What does it say about our heart? Do I have the heart of Christ? Do I have the heart of God for the lost? Or am I just here because it's comfortable? Because I got, I got my card punched, so I'm okay. This is Advent, people. This is one reason why the Anglican Church doesn't run all the way to Christmas as soon as Thanksgiving is passed. It's because we don't cover things like this. I was talking to Margaret the other day. She says, we celebrate the baby when he comes. Yeah, we prepare for the baby using a human thing, human analogy. We prepare for the baby when he's coming, but we really celebrate after the baby's here. What happens... And if, and if this touches anybody, I, I'm sorry, but what happens if you do all that preparation then all of a sudden, just before the baby's born, you find out it's, it's, for some reason that baby died? There's no celebration, is there? The celebration happens after the baby is born and it's alive and it's healthy. So in the Anglican tradition, other traditions as well, we slow everything down in Advent and we deal with stuff about being prepared prepared not just for the first advent of Christ, but for the second as well. Let me share this little quote. This is where I got off on that social media thing. This is from John Stott. You know I love John Stott. Uh, good Anglican, good, good theology. This came in just uh, last week on the 10th. Today's the 13th, came in three days ago. It's, it's titled Seeking God. This is short. They're all short. We must set aside apathy, pride, prejudice, and sin, and seek God in scorn of the consequences. Of all these hindrances to effective search, the last two are the hardest to overcome, intellectual prejudice and moral self-will. Just ponder those for a couple of seconds. Intellectual prejudice and moral self-will. Both are expressions of fear, and fear is the greatest enemy of the truth. Fear paralyzes our search. We know that to find God and to accept Jesus Christ would be a very inconvenient experience. It would involve the rethinking of our whole outlook on life and the readjustment of our whole manner of life. And that's where the rub comes for us, isn't it? I confess to you, I'm standing before you, it comes to me that same place. I'm not talking just to you, I'm talking to me as well. And it is a combination of intellectual and moral cowardice which makes us hes hesitate. We do not find because we do not seek. And we do not seek because we do not want to find. And we know that the way to be certain of not finding is not to seek. Not to seek. Again, back to 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Humble yourselves. Pray. Seek my face and turn from your wicked ways. You want to know why the world is in 
such chaos and turmoil and lawlessness, as it was said earlier in that video by John Bevere, is because the church is not, has not, is not doing that. Hasn't humbled itself. And no, you can't do it for your neighbor. You can't do it for your children. You can't do it for your spouse. You can only do it for yourself. Humble yourself. Pray. Seek. And yes, turn. Turn from your wicked ways. That's where the power, power and strength of grace comes in. And so I know, that whatever it might be, I, I know I'm, I'm supposed to do this, but I'm scared to death. But I'm going to do it. I know I'm supposed to turn from this, but ah, it doesn't matter. Does it really matter? Yeah, it does matter. It's not earning your salvation, once again. It is honoring God. And as we honor God, we experience His presence, we experience His power, He is glorified, and yes, yes, the world can change. So I ask us, are we humbling ourselves? Are we seeking Him? Are we praying? And are we turning from the wicked ways in our own lives? And maybe even calling others as we see it in their lives to turn from the wickedness in their lives as well. And yeah, you're going to say, but she's I'm going to come across as a holier than thou. Well, so what? So what? You can follow that up immediately. He says, hey, I'm struggling with the same stuff. But I know you are too. So let's, let's work on it together. How about we work on it together? Seek, pray, humble, repent. We're saved by God's grace, but He does call us to follow Him. And maybe follow Him out into that wild. Again, getting back to going into the wild. What is the wild? The wild for you. Pray about that. Again, that closing prayer we're going to have in just a few moments. It has a, it has a phrase in there. I'm going to highlight it now for you, so hopefully it will jump into your mind when we say it. Singleness of heart. Singleness of heart. Singleness of heart. May God be glorified. However it is we feel a need to repent. However it is we feel we need to engage the power that He's given us and live it out for His glory, not just for the balance of Advent, but for the rest of our lives. Father God, we thank You. We thank You that You have saved us by grace. We thank You that with that grace, You do want to stir up Your power among us. And that happens as we allow You to stir it up within us, within us as individuals. So come, Holy Spirit. Come and build up Your church. Come and show us where we need to repent, how we need to repent, and show us that we do have, because You're with us, we have the power to change not just ourselves, but we have the power to walk into the fullness of life that You have bought for us by Your death on the cross and the gift of the presence of the Holy Spirit within us. You have given it to us as a gift. And so now may You be glorified, Lord Jesus. May Your church be strengthened. May the light go out into the world as our Advent candles remind us every Sunday. May the light go out into the world through us, through Your church, for Your glory. And help us to know how to set aside our agenda and embrace Your agenda. For it's all in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen.